Hi, my name is John Hughes, and um, this video is mostly for high school chemistry students, but uh, might be useful for students in college who are also struggling with chemistry. For high school students, it's very important to distinguish between a variety of different compounds just from inspection. Um, <clears throat> there are more options than I have available here, but we've gone with your regular binary ionic compounds, ionic compounds that have polyatomic ions, and covalent compounds. So binary compounds are ionic compounds that only have two different ions, a positively charged cation and an anion <coughs> that is negatively charged. So if we draw cesium and its charge, and we also draw bromine, the negatively charged anion and its charge, those two ions would come together by opposite charges attract, much like a magnet. And you would write them just as CSBR. <clears throat> now, the way that you can tell that this is only made up of two single atom ions is to look for capital letters. This capital C indicates one thing and the next letter is lowercase and this capital B indicates another thing, bromine. You would name this compound by writing the name of the metal, cesium. Metals are positively charged, they always come first and then changing bromine to bromide. Essentially dropping the I-N-E for I-D-E and getting the compound cesium bromide. Now, compounds with polyatomic ions <clears throat> need to be identified quickly and accurately. So if we have a compound such as calcium phosphate, there are a couple ways to identify whether or not uh, this is a compound with a polyatomic ion. One would be to look for parentheses. When you see parentheses, you know that this is one ion. And since it's towards the back of the chemical compound, it will be a negative ion or an anion. Actually, phosphate is a PO4 3 minus ion. Now, this 2 just tells me that I needed two phosphate ions to balance my charges. <clears throat> Now, to name these compounds, you simply write the name of the metal, just like you did before, and just name the polyatomic ion second. So it's calcium phosphate. All right. Here, if you see... Typically, in an ionic compound, if you see more than two capital letters, you can bet it's also a polyatomic ion. This here is phosphorus, and this is oxygen. They're both capital letters, indicating that they are separate atoms. And that four is just telling me how many oxygens we have. We only have one phosphorus in this polyatomic ion. Now, covalent compounds are even easier, but to some people more difficult to name. So let's imagine that we have a compound with one carbon and four chlorines. <clears throat> okay, we would identify this on paper as being a covalent compound because it has no metals. So if you look at your periodic table, everything to the left of the uh, metalloids is a metal, which means most elements on the periodic tables are metals. 
A very small section in the upper right hand corner of your periodic table are non-metals and then also remember that hydrogen is also not a metal. So if you look in the upper right hand corner of your periodic table you'll see both carbon and chlorine. This would indicate that this is a covalent compound and that these atoms are sharing electrons. How electrons are shared we will discuss later but for now our only goal is to tell these three types of compounds apart. So now that we've decided there's no metals we know this is a covalent compound. This is when you have to use prefixes to name. So di equals 2, tri equals 3, tetra equals 4, and we can stop there for this particular chemical because we have one carbon and four chlorines. So list the name of the first element. C stands for carbon. Now, use the prefix to tell us how many chlorine atoms there are. So in this case, 4 is tetra, and we would write tetra chloride. Running out of space there. Let's write that real big right here along the bottom. Carbon tetra chloride. Okay, now notice that we have included IDE instead of chlorine, I-N-E. Same scenario with your covalent compounds. You must change the last three letters to IDE. At least at the high school level, that's the way they will appear. So we have our binary ionic compounds. Each ion is made up of one atom. Opposite charges attract. We name it cesium bromide. We identified this compound as polyatomic either by the presence of the parentheses or the fact that this ion here has two uppercase letters, meaning one phosphorus and four oxygens. Once we did that, we wrote down the name of the metal, calcium phosphate, and this is just the name of the polyatomic ion. You find these in lists, in tables, almost always on any standardized test you will see, or even a teacher-made test, you will see a table of polyatomic ions. If you're in college, you might have to memorize these. If you're in high school, I would memorize these. Now, just to give another example, let's look at another polyatomic compound. Now, in this case we don't have parentheses because sodium always has a plus one charge and NO3, which you may look up in a table as nitrate, has a negative one charge. So we're, we're electronically balanced, opposite charges attract, this thing comes together to form a compound. Some students don't recognize this as a polyatomic ion, but the presence of these three capital letters tells you you have three elements and as long as there's a metal in the compound that should tell you that this is a polyatomic ionic compound. Alright, so <clears throat> how do you name this? The metal here is sodium and the name of the polyatomic ion is nitrate And so the chemical is sodium nitrate. All right. On a broader note, if you see a metal in the compound, it will be ionic. You will have to decide whether it's a <clears throat> single atom ion or a polyatomic ion. We call these monoatomic ions. Once you decide that, you can use them in chemical equations and balancing correctly. If you can't decipher what these numbers mean and how to find polyatomics, you cannot balance an equation or succeed an entire second semester of high school chemistry. 
Also, you'll need to know that these covalent compounds like carbon tetrachloride, they react differently. They don't react in the same way as an ionic compound does. There's no transfer of electrons prior to bonding. It is a sharing of valence electrons to make a more stable electron arrangement. So, a couple more examples. Let's do this. CO2. Surprisingly, a lot of high school students know the name of this molecule, but can't write the uh, formula. This is simply carbon, writing the first letter, and di stands for two. We have two oxygens, so this is carbon dioxide. <clears throat> okay, this is how you would name covalent compounds. Notice there's not a metal in any one of these compounds, and that should be your identifier. All right, in other instances, let's do one more binary ionic compound. Let's suppose we have the aluminum three positive ion, and let's say we have fluorine, which is a one negative. Each ion is made up of one atom, but we have a problem. In order for these things to come together and form a compound, our positive charges must equal the negative charges. That can only be done by adding negative charges, that is having four fluorine, or three fluorines, each with a one, one negative charge, and then noticing that three positive, three negative charges, this is going to be our compound. We would write it as ALF3. No need for parentheses over here. We only use parentheses on these uh, polyatomic compounds, these ionic polyatomic compounds. So I see a lot of students who will do this. Because they're used to be being hammered on these polyatomic ions, and they make this mistake, and this will actually cause you to lose points on a lot of standardized assessments. All right, that's just some basics of uh, figuring out the difference between ionic and covalent compounds, and then identifying ionic compounds with polyatomic ions. I hope you found this video useful. Again, it's more for high school students who are needing to get chemical equations into their repertoire of chemistry skills. But for the struggling college student, your professor, if you went to a big school like I did, University of Kansas, is not going to tell you any of this. He's going to tell you to read the book, so you still might find this video useful. Um, thank you. Subscribe to this channel. You'll see more chemistry instruction, both advanced and high school level, in the near future. Take care.